let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to gather together like this as your children and hear the message your Spirit has for us this evening. We thank you so much that you are a personal God, that you not only live inside of us, but you speak to us and guide us if we're listening. And we ask tonight that you help us be humble before your word and your spirit and help us hear the message you have for us. Father, we ask that you bless those in our congregation who are sick and struggling in various ways. We thank you that you know all the details and that you always have divine purposes. And we ask that you bless them and heal them according to your will, of course. And Father, most of all, we thank you and we are so grateful that you were willing to give up your son for us, to send him down to become our replacement on the cross so that whoever believes in him will never perish but have eternal life. Father, as your adopted ones through Jesus Christ, we ask right now that you bless this time Help us concentrate. We ask your blessing in Christ's precious name and by the power of your spirit. Amen. Okay, stress part four. Hopefully you're all enjoying the series. I'm, I'm uh, really excited about it because obviously it's a topic we all deal with and suffer from in different ways. And I'm sure we're going to hear about various solutions or different ways to look at different things as we know um, a lot of our healing comes from having the right perspective so i'm sure we're going to get into some good perspectives as we keep going tonight we're going to start again with the quote from c.s lewis that makes us think this was from sunday morning on the board mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain but it is more common and also more hard to bear the frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It is easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. We don't want to look vulnerable, is what it comes down to. And honesty is a good place to begin to find freedom. Uh, freedom from stress even. Honesty with self first. We love to be in denial that we even have a problem, but then also honesty towards others. And we like to, and even want to, hide our weakness in front of others, but it's to our own detriment. You know, we're putting ourselves behind the eight ball when we do that, for no reason, really. And we allow things to build up inside that don't need to build up. And just think about when Ever you've been open and honest with other people uh, and you see that you're not alone like you thought you were and that others care about you but also can relate to you and that releases our stress doesn't it that in, in itself releases our stress so again this is one of those things we do to ourselves by hiding by holding it in by not being honest for example and even loving one another releases our stress. That was our last series, right? Love one another. Can't we just abide in, in love and, and let love do its work, including minimize stress? It's when we don't love one another that we think we're isolated, we think we're all alone, we think no one understands, et cetera, et cetera. So can't we be ourselves around those who love us? It's a good question, right? Around in, in the church family, can't we just be ourselves? In our own families, uh, amongst true friends, can't we just be ourselves? And hopefully the answer is certainly yes. Starting with the Lord himself and then with our fellow believers. So... 
I guess it comes down to this as we begin the message tonight. If we all know that we're all sinners, then why put on a front or put up a front? Why hide? Which is what C.S. Lewis was kind of referring to there. We, we're embarrassed or shameful to admit that we have mental stress or weaknesses. Why not instead be honest and simply admit we're flawed instead of covering ourselves up with a fig leaf? Our own solutions. And then together as brothers and sisters, we get our unity from Christ, who is the source of our deliverance. Each and every one of us. We need him to deliver us. So we're all in the same boat. Stress is so common because of the flawed condition we find ourselves in. All right, we've talked about a lot of the statistics, which are overwhelming. You know, you almost don't want to hear any more of them. It's such a common thing because of the flawed condition we find ourselves in. Being born in sin makes stress fundamental to being human. There's no way around it. You're born in sin, you're born depraved, you're born corrupt. So there's no way around it. It's part of being human. And in this series, I've been really pushed back by all the stats that we've seen and the, on the dangers of stress, you know, um, literally to our health and to um, even premature death it, it causes as a result of stress in our minds. Who would have thought that, right? So here again is the technical term that we went into on Sunday for the mind-body connection that exists in all of us on the board, psychosomatics, a branch of medical science dealing with interrelationships between the mind or emotions and the body, and especially with the relation of psychic conflict to somatic symptomatology. Try saying that one five times. Symptomatology, you know, symptoms. Body symptoms, somatic, soma, body symptoms. There are symptoms that come about in your body from, not psychic like you might think about it again, but mental issues, conflicts, mental stress lead to physical symptoms. So science has come up with this term uh, fairly recently compared to the history of the Bible. But simply put, there's a direct connection between what and how we think and how our body physically responds. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you just got to look at your own life. Look what happens to you when, when you're stressed. Look at your own physical res- Some people literally get sick, like physically get sick, even whether it's a virus or something like that, from just wearing themselves out up here and worrying like to no end. So for example, on this relationship, right? Have you ever had someone say to you, I can see it on your face. Don't lie to me. Anybody? Bueller? Nobody? Okay. Uh, I can see it on your face. Why are you telling me you're not worried about something right now? So your face is part of your body. Newsflash. So that comes from your mind. When your mind is stressed, you can see it on your face, even though you're trying to hide it. I used to think I have a poker face. I've learned recently that I do not have a poker face. Most of us don't have a good poker face. When we try to hide our feelings or our situation, like hide our stress. So another extreme example would be this. You might see someone shaking, like literally shaking. And it's not cold outside. And you conclude something's on their mind. They are really bothered by something. And you go over to console them. Why? Because the body reacts from the mental stress that's going on. They are directly related, as the Bible tells us. So we often know people are stressed by what's being revealed by their body and by their actions. And that's psychosomatics. And as Pastor brought out on Sunday also, it's not always a bad correlation. 
or you know a bad situation. For example, let's say you're focused on the Lord one day, and in that very moment, you believe with all your heart that He loves you and He's your best friend, and He's never going to leave you or let you out of His hands. And in that moment, you then experience that relief in your body. You feel relaxed, and your tension kind of goes away, at least in that moment, on that good day, quote-unquote, right? We all have good days and bad days. But you know what I'm saying. When you really have that clarity with God and that peace with God, your, your body physically changes. So there's very simply a direct cause and effect connection between what's going on in our heads and our bodies, whether good or bad. So when we use the term psychosomatics, think of the mind-body connection. Now, as the Bible clearly states, we've, we've gone into this, and this, is, this should be very freeing. Again, it's the ability to admit your weaknesses, to stop hiding and covering up for yourself or trying to present a certain image we humans are naturally weak whether we like it or not we are naturally by nature weak we're flawed and there's no getting away from that in this lifetime so in a sense why not embrace it why lie to yourself or lie to others on the board jeremiah 17:9 one of our main verses from Sunday. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Look at that. Look at those words. Desperately sick. Not kind of sick. Sick, sick. If you've ever said to yourself or someone else that you know, why the heck did you do that thing? What were you thinking? You might even say to certain people, that was so stupid. Why did you do that? Even though you knew it was wrong. Sometimes we literally do things that don't make sense that we know are wrong. We know are wrong. So that makes no sense, right? That's, that's irrational. You knew something was wrong going into it and you did it anyway. Why do we do that? That's our flesh. The flesh is irrational. It's naturally prone to to giving in to all kinds of lusts. And we're truly fallen creatures. It doesn't listen to rational thoughts of right or wrong, but it acts on impulse or obeys things like greed. It gets caught up in things like greed or lust. So we should understand that we're flawed and it's going to happen. We're all going to make stupid decisions, uh, in special, especially in moments of weakness, uh, when you're tired, um, including when you're stressed. You're going to make stupid decisions. It's part of being human. We will all struggle at times until the day we leave this corrupted body. But on Sunday, we were encouraged by one of what we would probably call one of our heroes in the faith, right? Someone we really look up to for how they follow the Lord and serve the Lord so selflessly. And that was the Apostle Paul. So turn again to Romans 7.15. 7, Romans 7.15. He was crying out in this chapter. And I don't know about you, but to know he struggled so much at times, even many, many years after he was saved, that gives me some hope. <laughs> it, it, it takes me away from unrealistic expectations and beating myself up. Romans 7.15 For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. This isn't like a teenager who's trying to find his way. Look at verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. There's the weakness of the flesh. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And then in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, 
who will deliver me from this body of death? He knew he was like trapped in this body. And that's the situation for now. It's a sinful, corrupted body. Who will, will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So this again proves the point that Jer Jeremiah was making on the board. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The point is nobody can. We try to like control it. We try to maybe even out of like a, a fleshly strength think that we can box it in. You know what I mean? And um, it becomes a religious thing, I think. But anyway, we can rightly say that we're all sick in the head, and the sooner we accept that reality, the sooner we can um, stop beating ourselves up, number one, and number two, be even more grateful for the Lord that he came to pay our price, because we truly are hopeless without him. So, to be human is to be flawed. That's kind of a, a recent conclusion here to embrace. To be human is to be flawed. That's just how it is. A disclaimer from our pastor on Sunday was that, are we saying you get a free pass because you're human? Not at all, right? Like, it's not, it's not the right perspective. The Bible says we're still responsible for our actions and decisions, and we will even reap what we sow if we persist in a certain direction and be arrogant about it. But the point is there's a difference between sinning and confessing it or repenting about it towards God and sinning because you think you have a God-given right to do so because he made you that way, using it as an excuse or a license to sin. Obviously, that is wrong. And if you persist in that way, you will reap what you sow in a bad way. So, you know, be humble, of course. In this series so far, we are simply facing the reality that we live in these corrupt bodies and we will never be perfect in this life. Stuck in the flesh for now. So again, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Why did you do that stupid thing? Who can understand it? They don't try to figure it out. This sickness of the heart is why every person desperately needs Christ. He's not an option, like a lot of people in the world think. He's maybe one of many options. On the contrary, he's the only hope of salvation from this body of death. I mean, if, if, if it's true what Jeremiah said about how desperately sick we are, who is possibly going to be able to save themselves? You need a doctor. You need a doctor with great wisdom. You also need a sacrifice. So he's the only person who also does understand the human heart completely. And this is very comforting. He totally understands the human heart. You can't even fake God out, right? You can't even pretend that you're believing a certain thing because he knows exactly what you're thinking. So we are to cast all of our anxieties on him. Even the ones about us hiding. You know, even those, the ones about us trying to prop ourselves up and deny our weakness or that we're as weak as others. We are to cast all of our anxieties on him because he understands us completely and totally. And here's a main point to me that, that's kind of stuck out from Sunday. We aren't to become overwhelmed by our flawed human condition. That's why he came, is it not? Because we were totally helpless or hopeless without a savior, someone to pay our price. We aren't to become overwhelmed by our flawed human condition. That would be a big mistake. On the board, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God already knows your weaknesses and failures anyway. Throw, throw it on him like you really trust your father, right? What a concept. If he really is your father and loves you that way and uh, no one can take you out of his hands, then throw it all on him. It's a, again, to boot, he already knows what you're thinking. So we should relax in that sense, right? He already knows what's going on in our sick, deceitful hearts. We should relax and be real and honest with him and know that he invites us to sit on his lap even though we sin every day. Just think about that. He doesn't like, how do you say it? He doesn't turn his back on us. And he already knows what you're going to do and thinking of doing and doing. He's like, come sit on my lap. I know. I know. Trust me. Come on. You're going to you want to confess to me? That's wonderful. It's intimate. But think about the fact that he loved you anyway and chose to do something about it. That's what's so baffling. The love of God, right, is baffling, really. So on the board, regarding God seeing the heart, we see 1 Samuel 16, 7b. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And again on the board, Psalm 44, 21b. For God knows the secrets of the heart. Ye. Right? I mean, I know he knows my heart, but he doesn't know all the little secrets that I'm... Yeah, he does. So surrender, right? Having all knowledge, God knows things about you that you don't even know. Consider that for a minute. I mean, that's comforting because that's how great he is. The one who loves you, that's how great he is. He knows things about you you don't even know. You might be 50, 60 years old. There's still many things you don't even know about yourself that he might reveal to you in the next coming years. But he knows many, many things you don't even know about yourself. Thank God he's on our side, right? When you sin, our Father in heaven says, I knew that was coming. I'm not surprised. And I had my son die for that sin also. So now what do you say? Thank you, Father. Your God and Savior knows very well that failing is part of being a human being. And we should be comforted by that. And maybe that's why last week's blog is leading us to freedom, even freedom from stress. On the board... There's a wonderful, excellent blog, which uh, I want to read again. Don't forget to be human. I'm human. I'm flawed. I'm weak. I'm normal, it turns out. Imagine that. Ever since the fall in the garden, that is what's normal, and that is what is irrefutable and inescapable. I'm human. I'm flawed. I'm weak. I'm normal, it turns out. Imagine that. To our topic of stress, the Bible reveals the idea of psychosomatics, that our mind and emotions will have an effect on our body and our health. Again, science is catching up to what the Bible recorded for us millennia ago. But turn in your Bibles again to Proverbs 14.30 for a very good example of this psychosomatics. Proverbs 14.30. And, I, you know, I think it would be wise to take this very literally. Some people like to spiritualize things in the Bible. But um, if all the things the Bible says is going to happen have already come true, think about all those things that have already come true, then you might just want to believe this and be humbled by it, right? Proverbs 14.30. 
A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. There's the good side of psychosomatics, right? A tranquil heart, mind, soul, thinking, gives life to the flesh, your body. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel whatever, at peace. But envy makes the bones rot. Envy makes the bones rot. That is scary. So on the board, here's a little side, whatever you want to call it, side note on the board, the curse of jealousy. The curse of jealousy. One of the greatest curses we place upon ourselves comes from comparing ourselves to others. You end up in, into envy. And the result, rottenness to the bones in Proverbs 14.30. The things we do to ourselves. If you look at your neighbor and become jealous in your heart of what they have or how they look, you're going to make yourself sick, literally. Literally. And if not, immediately it catches up with us over time, doesn't it? Things kind of wear us down. The longer you're stressed, for example, then eventually you get sick physically. So instead, keep your eyes on Christ alone instead of others and what they have and what they don't have and what you don't have. Keep your eyes on Christ alone, the one who totally understands you, your precious Lord and Savior, and have a tranquil heart that gives life to your flesh. That's God's destiny for us as his children. That's his desire for us as his children. Avoiding envy that develops rottenness in your bones, literally. So now let's bring all these things the Spirit has given us together so far. First of all, on the board, we know stress kills. There are negative results of it, especially over time. And on the board, stress implies cause and effect. There are two fundamental ways of dealing with stress. Remove the cause or remove yourself from the cause. So that's kind of where we've come so far on solutions, we might say. In other words, there's often a relief valve that we can use. If the source of stress becomes or is immovable, then we can, you know, duck out. We can physically remove ourselves. Uh, many times, not all the time. As the Spirit pointed out last time, there's nothing wrong with this. And again, this should be very comforting uh, with the Lord as our prime example. Pastor's disclaimer was this on Sunday. There are always balanced statements in the Bible, so don't become lopsided like we love to do. It doesn't mean you always can just quote-unquote run away from a stressful situation. It might not be the right thing to do. Options of reducing stress should be measured situationally and, of course, prayerfully. But every situation is different. In other words, running away from every stressful situation isn't the answer. There's a time for everything under the sun, as we talked about last week. So with that said, right now we're being encouraged that even Jesus knew when it was right to take a break. On the board, even Jesus removed himself from stressful situations. Don't ever feel condemned just because you need a break from those things that cause you stress. The strongest man to ever walk this earth isolated himself at times. A simple example for us might be walking away from an escalating situation with a friend or acquaintance. This came out on Sunday. I mean, usually you know when it's right to walk away. When You know when something's going nowhere, for example, right? So we get to choose who we hang out with. And maybe there's a time to separate from those who are causing you stress. Maybe it's even right at certain times, certain times, situations, and we pray to the Father for his timing, of course. But there are times where the right thing to do is to just walk away. Think about the apostles leaving the homes that they visited to spread the gospel, right? And when they were not received, they would have shaked the dust off their feet. 
That was the right thing to do in that situation. Shake the dust off your feet and leave. So think about the fact that that's the encouraging part of this so far, right? Is that this certainly is an okay thing to do um, to relieve stress or get away from unhealthy situations. So Pastor gave us some simple examples of when we might be wise to remove ourselves from stressful situations. Uh, walk away from an argument, uh, especially maybe one that is not rational and is becoming heated. And you usually know, so maybe simply change the subject or simply walk away. Uh, you also might be wise to walk away from physical danger instead of playing the hero or the risk taker. Um, you're here for God's purposes, and you might not want to make foolish decisions like walking into a, you know, backyard of a attack dog, right? Avoid the situation. Remove yourself from an overextended financial situation. I mean, this is where we get tested. Are we um, going to be in bondage to the world and what it tells us we should have, or are we going to be free from the bonds of the world? So, for example, downsizing in America is not talked about much, but um, it should be because it gives you freedom. <laughs> freedom instead of slavery to so many things and objects and possessions. And sometimes, uh, by the way, it's wise to just cut your losses and be set free from an unnecessary stressful situation, financially in particular. Cut your losses. Nobody wants to cut their losses, right? I want to get it back. I just lost something. I want to get it back. You might be wise to just cut your losses and move on and be set free from that uh, stress. And then also another example is to walk away from bad relationships, especially with unbelievers. We should really guard our souls. So we've got to reduce causing ourselves unnecessary stress. We do it to ourselves so many times. Again, on the board, one example is the curse of jealousy. One of the greatest curses we place upon ourselves comes from comparing ourselves to others. That came out a lot on Sunday in the conversation about social media, by the way. And, you know, some people will go on things like social media and think it's not affecting them. But these things subtly affect us. What we see and hear and tune into subtly wear us down build up stress. We don't, we don't always look at every person we see on Facebook and say, oh, I wish I had that. 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 How come I'm not like them? How come I don't have that? That's not what we do. We look at 10, 20 people on Facebook, right? We're flipping through, whatever. And then, bingo, there's one that gets you. Really pricks you. And you're like, ugh. You know what I'm talking about. Same thing if it's not social media. You know, it might be a, a wrong person that, that brings you down because you have a problem with jealousy or envy. So the point is so many times in life we do it to ourselves, don't we? I have a sticking your tongue out emoji in my notes. We do it to ourselves. So anyway. God's trying to set us free with this series. On the board, walking away from harmful situations. In general, you, of all people in this world, have the ability to remove yourself from harmful situations. There aren't any real excuses not to, though it may be understandable given your sick heart. Remember, right, we all make stupid decisions that are unexplainable because we're desperately sick. So, yeah, it might be understandable, but there's not real excuses not to separate yourself from harmful situations that are not from God. The Spirit wants this series to be edifying for all of us. He's making sure we approach it with great empathy for the human condition. Um, this came out last week, too, I believe, on Thursday night. Because of the base problem, the base problem is we're all flawed, right? There's no exceptions. 
We must see each other, therefore, with compassion, regardless of the type of failures we see in each other. What do we do? In the flesh, we love to compare, and we love to say, oh, they're weak in that area? What's wrong with them? And then the other person saying something else about you in their head, because you're weak in a different area. That's, that's not the point. The point is we're all flawed. We're on the same you know, wavelength. So regardless of the type of failures we see in each other, we should have compassion for the base problem. It's empathy for each other that we're all in the same boat. We're all stuck in the human condition. So be encouraged. Like, like no matter who you know, we, we see around us, especially in the body of believers, we're all truly in the same boat. Imagine being in a boat stuck with a bunch of people in the middle of the ocean together. Are we going to compare each other's, you know, hairstyles or who's got better jeans or shoes? We wouldn't even consider it. Why? Because we realize we're stuck in the middle of a deep, dark ocean together in the same boat. We might want to stick together. We might want to love one another <laughs> as a concept and transcend it all, all that stuff. We're going to stick together because we're all flawed. We're all in the same sticky situation. And it's not about the person to my right, I think is a little bit better than me. The person to my left is a little bit worse than me. That's not it. We're, that's, that's where we stay down in the weeds. We're not, again, rising above it all. We are indeed made uniquely by God, as we've heard recently in the messages. But we're all the same, too. We're all flawed, trapped in the human condition. So we love one another and have compassion towards one another. Amen? I mean, we'll see where the Spirit goes further from that concept. But let's close tonight with some encouraging scripture. Uh, go to Psalm 73:21 again. Psalm 73:21. God is faithful. Whew. And um, when you see all the passages about his faithfulness and you realize that he's perfectly faithful, he's not mostly faithful, he's perfectly faithful to his children, that's where it's overwhelming. That's where we are set free. Psalm seventy-three twenty-one. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. <laughs> you ever see a kid trying to run away from their parents, but the kid's only five, and the parents got their hand, you know, and he's trying to run with all his might as though he's got a shot of getting away, but he's not going to be able to get away. Imagine how much greater that is with God. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. But again, look at verse 26. This should be so encouraging. My flesh and my heart may fail. Think of Paul in Romans 7. The psalmist is kind of saying the same thing. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So stress is a part of life. We know this. We as children of God want to get to the point where we're able to handle stress in a way that brings glory to God. And Pastor made a point of this on Sunday to not miss this. Fundamentally, our first priority, our base motivation is always to bring glory to God. 
And if we remember that, then everything we realize has a purpose and a meaning. And we don't get overwhelmed. We have a divine purpose to bring glory to God in any situation. So if we make this our good intention each day, then God promises to deliver us no matter what. Think about that. If we make it our good intention each day to bring glory to God, then God promises to deliver us no matter what. We don't know how, we don't know when, but he will. Guaranteed. And it was at this point on Sunday, I wrote down a certain verse in my notes. And it just so happens the Spirit had Chris also refer to the same verse in communion service on Sunday. On the board, Romans 8:28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Doesn't this promise help us transcend it all? I mean, you don't have to stay down in the areas of worry and details. All things, he will work together for good for those who love him. Does it not allow you to look past or rise above the details of life and remain in the sphere of love? It doesn't mean we're not going to fail. We will sin. We'll be tempted to spiral downwards even and stay in it. We'll be tempted. But let us not be overwhelmed, even by our own failures, under pressure or stress. He promises if we put him first, if we love him first, that he will work all things together for good for us. So if that's true, if this verse is true on the board, what's left to really worry about? Even your own sins and failures. Should we let those overwhelm us? Is it right to worry about those things? If this is what God says about us? Cling to this with all the faith that he's given you. It helps you rise above it all, the fray. And finally, what came out on Sunday was that our destiny as children of God is to rise up when we fall. We are not like those of the world who stay down or downtrodden. We have the hope above all hopes. We have eternal life in the loving arms of our Lord and Savior forever? We already have it. Why would we ever completely give up hope? Why would we ever despair and be overwhelmed even by our own ugly failures? On the board, Proverbs 24, 1. For the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Listen, God's got your right hand, do you remember? He's got your right hand, even though you were brutish towards him. Even just three hours ago, before he came to church. He's got your right hand. Even the angels are watching, saying, what's he going to do now that he failed again? Is this the last straw? Is he going to give up? Talking about you and I when we sin. Get up, was the message on Sunday. You're a child of God. By grace not by what you deserve. You're a child of God. So get up. You have the right to do so. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139.1. Psalm 139. Let's just read this first part of this chapter. So encouraging. And it will remind you of the verse we read earlier about how God has our right hand. Psalm 139, to the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. 
you hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Let's remember Peter's guidance as we close this evening on the board. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for the amazing promises and statements of faithfulness that we find in your word. You are so faithful beyond what we can even really fathom and understand. But we thank you that you promised to never let us go. And even in our stupid failures, even in our ugliest moments, you have our right hand and you won't let us go. Let this Father make us more grateful and more in love with you for what you have done for us and what you continue to do for us so that we can bring you glory with our lives as you designed. We ask that you bless us as we go. We ask these things in Christ's precious name and by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen.